In the last video, I talked about how an entrepreneur's vision is different from a leader's vision and how the entrepreneur can grow to become a leader. In this series of videos, I'm gonna be doing the same thing for relationships, the next function of leadership. Here's what I mean by relationships. Relationships are the connections between people that allow the work to be done. When you as an entrepreneur start a business, you know how to do the work. You do it by yourself or with a group of friends or co-founders, but then you begin to scale and you start to hire people. You have to teach those people how to do the work that you have been doing by yourself. But there's something different now. People have to work together. They have to interact to perform individual separate tasks that get combined into the final product. This is fundamentally different than being an entrepreneur where you perform all of the work yourself. So entrepreneurs have a tendency to want their people that they hire to do it their way, to do it how that person has been doing it since they started the business. But this has a couple really serious consequences. First, it misses out on the most valuable aspect of working with other people. New ways, new perspectives to do things better, faster, easier, and more efficiently. Just because you as an entrepreneur have been doing this work yourself does not mean that you have the best solution, nor does it mean that in the new situation with additional people, your old solution is still a good one. Also, when you command people to do it my way, you're minimizing their contribution. Remember the story of vision that we talked about in the last videos? When you say, do it my way, you're telling them that their independent thinking is not valuable, that it does not help that change become real. And that disconnects them from their identification with the story of vision. These two things together result in the people that you hire not being as committed or motivated to the success of the group as you are. It's partially your fault as an entrepreneur because you are doing it the entrepreneur's way and not the leader's way but we can fix this. And when we do that, we get people who we bring in, who we hire, who are as committed and motivated, who are as dedicated to this, the success of the organization. And that is very powerful. That's when the group gets to excellence. So what are relationships within all of this context? Relationships are the interactions between people practiced over time until they become habitual routine patterns of behavior. Relationships are the way that multiple people work together to perform the tasks of the organization. They are how we divide tasks among multiple people, perform them, and then combine them into the final product. Relationships are not the tasks themselves. They are everything necessary to perform those tasks in the group. We start by recognizing that there are two types of relationships, two types of these interactions between people. We're gonna talk about each in turn. First, there are interchange relationships. Interchange relationships are things that are passed between people, transferred or exchanged. These are the elements that each person needs to complete his or her work. And if people do not get these things, then the work that they complete, the tasks that they complete, will be incomplete or of inferior quality. Interchange relationships limit the quality of work that individuals can perform. As an entrepreneur, you haven't had to pay attention to these relationships because you've always done these internally in your own head. You've always had access to these things. Now that you're in a group and tasks are being divided among many people, you have to pay attention to how things are transferred between the members of the group so that they can do their individual jobs. If you don't, the group will be unable to reach excellence. So what are interchanges? There's a range of interchange elements or the things that are actually passed back and forth. These are things like products or resources, partially completed products, the raw materials that a person needs to perform their job. But they're also abstract things like information. How many items uh, do we need to make today? Or how much stock do we have in the supply room? Or decisions about what color we're gonna make our widgets today or how many. And they get more complex from there into expectations and incentives, which describe how we want people to do certain things and how we reward or punish those people when they do not. And ultimately to knowledge, which is the explanation for why certain things are done in a certain way. Interchange relationships or the transfer of these things between people are practiced over time until they become the way we do it. See the difference? This isn't the way I do it, but the way that the group does it. It's not the way that the entrepreneur used to do it alone, but the way that the group does it now together. So when an interchange element is passed back and forth, it doesn't just have the content of that interchange, what is being transferred. There's also characteristics that describe the relationship itself. 
These include obviously the content, the item that is being passed back and forth, the piece of information or the resource, whatever it might be. But the way that that item is transferred affects the quality of the relationship and therefore the quality of the work that can be completed. This is things like how that relationship is documented. Is it a policy or procedure? Is it an informal expectation? Interchanges are also triggered. That is that there is something that says the interchange should be performed now. And finally, interchanges have both givers and receivers because items are being transferred. Somebody has to manufacture, create, come up with the uh, piece of information, for example, and somebody has to receive it. There has to be both sides of the exchange. So here's an example of an interchange. You might need to keep track of the company's raw materials so you can order more from a supplier before the company runs out. This is an information interchange. You have to formalize, as a leader, you have to formalize the relationship in a way that works. So you have to know what you're counting, specifically which items are being counted, who does that counting, who do they hand that piece of information off to, who needs to know to order more, uh, how does that person doing the counting know when they should perform the inventory? How do they know what the information should look like when they get ready to transfer it? And so on. You might trust your people individually to keep track of their resources and come to management when they're getting ready to need more, which is a very informal way to handle this challenge. Or you might have a very formal process, which is a weekly inventory with a spreadsheet done by a specific person who is assigned responsibility in a policy or procedure. Both of these solutions generate the piece of information about when new resources need to be ordered, but they do it in very different ways. If the inventory runs out, people won't be able to do their jobs. So if you trust individual members of the group to track their resources and they fail to do that, the quality of output of the organization as a whole is affected. If you do this right, you'll never run out of inventory. You'll always have supplies. People will always be able to do their jobs. And if you see yourself running out of inventory, you know you haven't built this relationship properly. You have to figure out what characteristics of the interchange relationship are not working and change them so that they do work. So when you become an entrepreneur, here's what you have to ask about interchange relationships. What do people need to do their jobs? And what characteristics do these transfers need to make sure that things get done? then you can build interchange relationships that over time become practiced habit. That's the first type of leadership relationship. The second type is emotion relationships. These are very different. Emotion relationships are the feelings and assumptions that people experience as they interact with others in the performance of work. These are a natural consequence of working with other people. We get bad feelings like frustration, distrust, being devalued, anger, impatience, but we also get good feelings like trust, support, self-worth, belonging. The interactions that we have cause us to feel emotions and over time, these emotions cause us to select specific behaviors, to act in specific ways. When we interact with other people, we expect them to cause us to feel a certain way, so we treat them in a corresponding way. If these are good, productive relationships, then we're positive around that person. We can treat them well. If we have negative emotion experiences that turn into negative emotion relationships, we're going to treat people negatively and that's gonna make us less productive. When you're a solo entrepreneur, you don't have to worry about hurting your own feelings, but when you become a leader, now you do have to worry about other people's feelings. This is a very important transition. The role of leadership here is to influence interactions so that people act in positive ways to each other and to minimize bad interactions. Now we can't make anyone behave in a specific way. That's really important. But we can create an environment in which people know what good behaviors look like and they're rewarded for those good behaviors. And we can avoid bad behaviors because we disincentivize them. We handle them through performance counseling. We can also provide context and support to help people get through their negative feelings, which inevitably arise. And we can model good behaviors so that people copy us and do what is productive and helpful. How do we make sure that the emotion relationships in the group as it begins to form when we hire new people are positive and productive? The first thing that we do is just to be aware, just to see what other people are experiencing and feeling. As solo entrepreneurs, we tend to be very focused on the job on tasks, now we have to start paying attention to other people and their experience working in this group. We can't tell exactly what's going on, but we can imagine ourselves and deduce what they are probably thinking and feeling. 
this awareness is the beginning of our ability to act on those relationships to make them productive. So we pay attention. We recognize and validate others' feelings. We speak out when something is good or bad. We recognize what's happening and how people feel. And we talk about how important it is that we have good feelings between members of the team. This sounds very touchy-feely, but it doesn't have to be. The words that we choose to use are up to us. Secondly, we support positive emotion relationships by managing ourselves and our own impact. This is the one aspect that we can control and others will copy us, particularly in a new organization where relationships are not strongly defined. We set the tone. As leaders, we set the tone. If we treat people a certain way, that's going to become a natural habitual pattern of behavior for the organization as a whole. This is the power of relationships for good or bad. What does this mean? We have certain behaviors we use because they are comfortable, familiar, practiced. These are called preferences. They come naturally, they come easily. It's how we have related to people throughout our lives. Because we're entrepreneurs, we're, we're generally strong individuals, these behaviors are probably assertive, directive, perhaps even confrontational. Maybe not, but often they are. In any case, we have to recognize that just because a behavior is easy and we've practiced it does not mean it's productive. So we have to be able to see in ourselves when something that we do, a behavior of ours, isn't working. And we have to secondly develop a way to perform an alternative behavior. We need a process to do this. Otherwise, we're fighting against the power of habit and familiarity without any formal structure. And we're very likely to lose. We'll keep doing what we've always done rather than what works. Which brings us to the third function of leadership, which is learning, which we'll cover in the next set of videos. Let me show you how relationships are a function of leadership. We talked about this with vision. People make meaning of their lives every single day, whether there's any influence from a leader or not. This is also true of relationships. Members of every group build these relationships even without any influence from a leader. People go about their work and they figure out ways to interact with others, whether they're productive or not. Particularly in a new organization, but in all groups, people are figuring out how to relate to each other. They try new things, they see what happens, and they keep some behaviors and discard others. Over time, these behaviors add up, and the sum of all of the behaviors, all of the interactions within an organization become what is called organizational culture. Now, that's a big word, and this is a huge topic, and we'll come back to it later, but it's important to recognize organizational culture is a description of the sum of all relationships within an organization. If we want to change organizational culture, we change relationships, individual relationships, there is no way to act on the abstract organizational culture itself. If people build these relationships, these patterns of behavior, and they're good, productive, then the company or organization will succeed. If the patterns are bad, the organization will struggle and perhaps ultimately fail. We can't act upon all of these constant experimentations that the, the members of the group are doing as this function, but we can act on specific moments and specific interactions to target the ones that matter, that influence the rest of the relationships in the right direction. This is particularly true in new organizations where these relationships are very young, where they're just developing. This is why understanding the two types of relationships, both interchange and emotion, is so important. When we see that people don't have what they need to do their jobs, we can build an interchange relationship with the right structure to get them those things. And if we see people struggling with negative feelings, we can act upon the interactions within the group to replace those that are causing those negative feelings. This is leadership. And it's not something as an entrepreneur that we have necessarily done before, though we have, it's just been invisible. But now that we are leaders, we must do it if we want the group to succeed. Otherwise, we're allowing things to be left to chance to this ever-present function of building relationships without any guidance. We can guide the outcome. We can determine what is going to happen, but we have to be aware of what's going on to do so. And to do that, we have to see and understand relationships.